Welcome, 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 LinkedIn. We're jumping into today's show. It's all about challenging you to create your own destiny with Jen Allen. Here we go. Steve Spiro, you're a mentor, you're a consultant, you're a business owner, but most importantly, you're a host of your own show and you're also a master connector. Steve Spiro is one of my idols and I love listening to everything that he does. He's such a dynamic individual. Some of the topics I really enjoy speaking on is how to really connect, you know, whether it be in person or through social media. I love to lead with my weaknesses. I lead with, you know, my vulnerabilities. It's fine because I'm okay with who I am. Number two is how to go from being inward focused, self-focused into others focused. Being willing to give and, and go out there and, and, and look to serve, that will attract the right things. Another one is on leveraging LinkedIn to really grow your business. You can reach a lot more people. You can broadcast a message to people that actually consented to want to know you. And then lastly, overcoming big obstacles. I love sharing. I was a shy, jabbered kid, picked on, bullied, learning disabled, dyslexic, really in a dark place. I was really in a box in the shell. And I've been able to break out of that box. And, and so I love being able to inspire people and really help them. So the Master Connector was born. The world is my networking event. Right? I meet people all the time. My goal is to meet three strangers every single day. Steve is open to meeting you. You should set up a face-to-face -face with Steve. One little conversation can really change your life. All right, my folks, we are excited to get into today's topic. I'm excited to be with you. This is the Master Connector Show. My name is Cameron Toth. I'm going to bring you Steve Spiro, who's going to jump in to today's topic. Absolutely. Good stuff. And again, thank you, Cameron, for being the man behind the scenes here and doing all that you do. But it's going to be a great topic. So make sure you're putting in the comments where you're tuning in from. Make sure you're networking with each other. We love our community. We appreciate you guys. You know, and we want to make sure you're a blessing to each other. So get in there and, and tell us where you're from and, and network with each other. So, um, but hey, I have a question for you guys. Have you ever felt stuck? Well, here's the deal. The answer, the solution, the secret is take action, right? Just take action. And I want to tell you, and you're going to learn today, that you really can create your own destiny. You really can. Uh, I got a quote from Steve Jobs who said, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your life. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. This approach will let you, will never let you down. And it has made all the difference in my life from the great Steve Jobs, right? And today we are really going to challenge you to create your own destiny. So if you're ready, we're gonna, we're gonna bring uh, our, our guest up. I know Cameron's gonna introduce her and. So if you're ready, I want you to go ahead, write in the comments right now and type in hashtag ready if you're ready for Cameron to bring up our amazing, amazing guest. So type in ready and Cameron, I'll pass it to you, sir. Absolutely. All right. So we're going to jump in here. I'm going to introduce Jen Allen to everybody. Throw her onto the screen. Thanks for being here with us, Jen. I put that quote up on the screen from uh, uh, our friend Steve Jobs here and uh, the Master Connector. Put that hashtag ready in. Jen Allen is the Chief Evangelist at Challenger and co-host of the Winning the Challenger Sale podcast for Challenger Inc. Jen is passionate about partnering with business-to-business -business commercial leaders to implement the Challenger methodology in order to help their teams stop losing deals to status quo, price, or no decision. Previously, Jen spent 12 years at Corporate Executive Board and Gardner as a Business Development Director, selling and advising Chief Sales Officers, Chief Marketing Officers, Chief Strategy Officers, and Chief Communications Officers at large enterprises on functional best practice improvement, repping the Chicago suburbs. Please welcome to the show, the generous, the sales generous. Generating Jen Allen. Oh my gosh. Can I just take you everywhere with me? Like I'm even more hyped than I already was to be here. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome. I'm so excited to, excited to spend the time together today. Now you know why, Jen. I, I keep him close by. <laughs> 
he, he has a tendency to elevate everybody that he's with. So yes, I love it. No I doubt about it. it. So he's great. Um, good stuff. So, Hey, uh, really appreciate having you on here. Obviously it was great when we had a chance to connect initially and, uh, you know, I know this is the secret to our community, but Jen and I met through LinkedIn, right? Go figure, huh? Uh, that's a weird concept, right? But uh, so we want to dig into some questions here. And um, so we, our amazing community, we know we're all about stories. So if you're ready for me to ask this next question, I'd like you to type, type in the comments right now. Hashtag story. You know, hashtag S-T-O-R-Y. I believe I'm spelling that word right. <laughs> learning, dis learning disabled dyslexic guy. Sometimes you never know, right? You got it right. But anyway, was that Cameron? Right. You got it right. I got. I you. got it right. All right, cool. All right. So hey, we all have a backstory. We all we all come from someplace. We want to hear you know a short version of your backstory and how you became a chief evangelist. So let's hear it. Yeah. So um, the quick version of it, uh, I've been in sales for the last roughly 18 years. And I'm one of those weirdos who loved being on the front line. Like I never wanted to be a manager, never wanted to run a sales organization. I've always just felt like sales is something where you can never stop learning. Like it's really hard to become a quote unquote expert in sales. Still to this day, don't feel like it. So every year across my career, every couple years, I would start to get that itch where I would say, okay, I feel like I've learned a lot and I'm ready for my next challenge. What is that next challenge going to be? So in 2021, I realized that as much as I was still learning and learning and learning about large enterprise selling and selling these big transformational solutions, I started to get an itch where I said, I'm looking at LinkedIn. I'm seeing the conversations that are happening there. I'm listening to podcasts and I'm realizing that there's a whole opportunity that is untapped by your organization to be part of that conversation, be part of the channels in which our customers go to learn. And so I spent some time last year actually kind of doing it off the side of my desk. So I got involved in our company's podcast. I started creating content for webinars. I started becoming far more active on LinkedIn. And what I found was actually, it was really sparking something in me. It was sparking a new energy, a new feeling of learning, a new set of skills I was building. And on the other side of it, it was also generating some pretty cool impact for our company. So senior executives who wouldn't necessarily fill out a lead form were hitting up me in the LinkedIn DMs and saying, hey, I've always been kind of curious about this. Can we just have a conversation? And so in November, I went to our CEO and said, look, like, I totally understand this is a crazy title. This is a new emerging role, but here's the impact I could see this potentially having in our business. And here are some of the wins so far this year that they've been able to generate. Would you be opposed to actually trying this at a larger scale next year and formalizing this into a role? So a lot of pieces came together. One it, that I'm really grateful for is our CEO is very open-minded to trying new things. Um, but that's how I got to become the chief evangelist starting in January of this year. And it's been a really fun ride. That's that's pretty awesome, pretty amazing. It's great, and uh, you know, I, I know I, I think Gary V is the one who kind of created his own role, right? He, I think he created like the um, uh, chief heart officer or something, if I'm not mistaken. Or he, <laughs> you know, and so hey, why not create it? Create a role for yourself, right? It's it's pretty awesome, but um, that that's awesome, great stuff, and of course, um, much respect to to what you've done and what you're doing. So here, here's what we want to do. We, we, we want, again, we want to get, you know, we love our community. We love our viewers. We want to make sure you're involved. We're not just, you're not just lurkers. We want you getting in the comments. So we're going to ask you, we're going to go into some what questions. So we want to type in hashtag what community. Let's say, let's put in, there it is. Thank you, Cameron. Put in what if you're ready for this next question that, that we're going to ask, uh, Jen. And that is, what does it mean? To be a chief evangelist, and I'm, and I don't mean just the, you know, you go, you can go into some detail on what that all means and why that, if you could, and what it means to you, perhaps. Yeah. So, like I said, it's not a really well known or well utilized term. I think in many cases it was used in technology companies to evangelize new technology. My first um, exposure to it was actually from an article I read from a company called BombBomb, Bomb, and they were interviewing different evangelists in the sales community. So people like Dan Steinman at Gainsight, Guy Kawasaki, who obviously was probably the most original, like you know, creator of evangelism. And I started learning about it. And what it came across to me is that evangelism is not about evangelizing your products and solutions. In many cases, that's the role of marketing. 
But for certain companies, we have complicated perspectives on a problem or we've got insight on a problem that customers don't typically appreciate or understand. And it can be really difficult for sales and marketing to go and sell that because we have to do upfront education on the problem. And I was running into that all of the time. So to me, evangelism and being a chief evangelist is simply about Think of it almost as like edge sales, like going out and educating the market on a problem that they maybe are underappreciating or thinking about in a different way and sparking a conversation where our customers go to learn. And so that's kind of what it means to me. But there's different instances, right? Some companies look at it more as a storytelling role. Some companies look at it more as a community role. So I don't think there's a rigid definition. I think it sort of depends on the business problems that the company you work for is trying to solve and you know the, your role in sort of playing into that. It's great. So, so you don't have to be a preacher to be yeah. a chief evan evangelist, I guess. Huh? <laughs> no, but I often get that question. Yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. I get it for sure. That's awesome. Um, yeah, you know, and, it, and it's funny. I want to talk about the next uh, question here and kind of dig into this a little bit more. And, you know, uh, our topic today here is challenging you to create your own destiny. And I, I had some fun this morning. I put a post out. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to see it, Jen. But uh, it was on, you know, kind of the battlefield in our mind. And we're, we can be so hung up on, you know, the programming and what we, how we grew up and the different things that, you know, people in our life taught us, you know, uh, and told about us, right? You know, I have a, a good friend, a mentor to me who's, <clears throat> he, his, his daughter, his oldest daughter was very quiet and the family would, would insist, oh yeah, she's shy, she's shy. He'd get upset, like pissed at them because they were labeling and programming her. He, he said, no, no, she's not shy. She's an observer, right? And 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 so she's at a, and she, I've, now she, I think she's like 28 now and she's an amazing lady. And um, and I just, I've seen how the, the reprogramming or protecting her from the programming. So we really do have the ability through, you know, our belief systems, through the people that we surround ourselves with, for me, a mentor in my life, some, you know, and I've had quite a few people in my life that have mentoring roles, but in particular, one, one in particular, and then, you know, also, you know, the ability to have, you know, again, not, not getting religious on anyone, but for me, it's been spiritual, right? Having somebody, uh, you know, for me, a heavenly father that, 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 I, that uh, allowed me to understand that I am, you know, I was made for greatness. So I was, you know, I have the seed of, of greatness within me and I was engineered for accomplishment and, and, and all those things. And so, Want to talk a little bit about destiny today? So, if you're ready, uh, community, uh, I'd like you to type in the word destiny. You know, hashtag destiny. And and so, what we want to ask you is, and again, you don't have to be as as kind of big picture, kind of you know, uh, out there as as that kind of setup was. But what does it mean? What are some things that you believe you can do to create your own destiny? Yeah, I'm curious to see this. Do you want me to answer that as well? Or? You, you could you could start answering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they'll catch up. <laughs> don't want to There's a little lag anyway, so they'll catch up. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, so I think you you hit on one thing that I think is incredibly important, which is who we surround ourselves with. So I grew up in a really, really small town, um, was the first in my family to go to college. And it was like, if I looked at the community I was surrounded by growing up, I kind of relate to the story you told, right? I didn't see myself as an executive. I didn't see myself as someone that was even ever going to be in sales, candidly. It just felt very foreign to me. And I think as a byproduct of moving to DC and then moving to Chicago and consist consistently surrounding myself with people that were very different from me who at face value, I thought like, man, we just don't have a lot in common. I have always been surprised. I don't know why I'm still surprised at how much we can learn from others who look very different to us. And so I think in my own experience, in my own job, and my own progression, part of it has been surrounding myself by people who I think are, who I know are unafraid to tell me hard truths. And that works both in a positive and a negative way. And what I mean by that is like, I was on a call earlier today with someone who I really respect in the sales community. He's incredible at what he does. And I knew that if I came to him with a question, he would tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. 
And he is one of many people in my life that I surround myself with that I can have that kind of relationship. And it's built on respect. It's built on a mutual interest in helping each other be the best we can be. It is not built on this idea of like, I'm right and let me condescend Jen and tell her all the things that she's getting wrong. It's because I've built that foundation of trust. What I would advise anybody is sometimes we lock ourselves in to letting our own manager be that only voice. And so one thing I learned fortunately pretty early in my career is if you are just learning from your formal reporting structure, you're missing out on a huge opportunity to gain valuable perspective from people that like maybe don't even do your job, but have really interesting takes. And that I think is part of the reason why I've moved around in different roles is because of that exposure to other people and other perspectives. But what do you think, Steve? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. No, it's I, I, I look, no, number one, I, I, I have some mixed feelings about, about speaking the truth into somebody, right? I think for a long time, there was some people in my life that they were well-intentioned and they spoke and they spoke things about me. And I, you know, my viewers know that the community we have, they, they know, I, you know, I, I talk about it. I had more hangups than the phone company. Okay. I was, <laughs> I was in a bad place for a lot of years. And there was, there was a tendency, I believe that some of that's that that critical and i'm sure it was constructive criticism but what it did is it just kept reinforcing to me because i was broken you know that i'm just not good enough right mm. so there's a fine line i think you gotta you, you know it, you know I, I, we haven't been blessed to, be, to have kids but we have fit friends and family around us and you don't treat every single kid exactly the same right every kid has a different personality and I think that's the same with, you know, people in your life, whether they have a, a leadership role, mentorship role, kind of managing role, there's, there's different things that they could, they could do to, to help you. And I think what I needed for a while, quite, quite a while was just encouragement, just say, you know, emphasizing what I was doing right versus kind of, you know, constantly talking about what I wasn't doing right, even though the heart was right, it wasn't about trying to be, you know, you know, somebody who was condemning me, that wasn't out, but it came, it, it, it just, in fact, it wore on my self-esteem over time, you know, and, and so there's, I think there's a fine line there, but I totally agree with you, getting yourself around the right people, not looking for one resource, one source as your only way to feed uh, how, you know, you're, you, you, you are and, and, you know, where you could go. I mean, I believe that, you know, another way that you could really grow yourself, and, and that is not only surround yourself by people that are better than you, but also go and serve other people. And if you serve them, that also helps you. You learn in that, you know, you learn through, you know, the best way as a martial artist, the best way that I learned about techniques and and and, and prove myself in the martial arts was when I went and taught my students. I learned the best when I'm teaching, when I'm helping somebody, right? And so just some things that helped me, but but I'd love to dig in a little deeper on destiny, right? And and I feel like we kind of we kind of got on that, but, ne but I'd like to go a little deeper if we can uh, on on you know because you, you're you're a big believer in I know how you can kind of you know you could kind of change your career and trajectory and all that kind of stuff by by that it, and not it doesn't have to be focused on career, but but on how you can make your your life better. So just if you can if there's any more thoughts, I'd love to hear a little more of, of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think for me, one of the big reflection points has always been to stay truthful about what brings me joy. And I know that sounds kind of cheesy and genericized. So let me be more specific. Like good. when I look at my job, right. Or what my job was a year ago, which is, was sales, right. It was going out and doing new logo acquisition. There were parts of that job that I really, really loved. Um, and still do love because I still do carry a bag. But there were parts of the job that I would find myself when I would see calendar invites on my calendar that I would be like, oh, I'm just kind of dreading, I'm dreading this call. I'm dreading this conversation. Not because I felt like, hey, I'm not going to do well. It just, it didn't give me meaning. It didn't give me purpose. And one of the things I struggled with a lot that Steve, you and I talked about was in sales and in many other professions, there's just this like linear path of moving up. Where in sales, it's like you might start as an STR and then you move to an AE or an AM and then you move to a sales manager and then you're a director and then you're a VP and then you're a CRO. And that was very boring to me, right? Because as much as I, like you, Steve, get a ton, like my cup is filled by working with other people who are new in their career because I was fortunate to have someone who was newer, like when I was newer in my career that really mentored me and spent a lot of quality time with me. I knew I didn't want to create 
the manager job. But at the same time, there was no other role on the org chart. So the way I thought about it was this. First, I have to be super clear about what drives my passion. And I have to be able to articulate it in a way that others can understand. Like if it makes sense in my own, own head, great. But I'm what I'm still doing is I'm trying to sell someone an, an idea, right? So I have to make sure my message, my why, my what is this, like what is the value inherently in this for the company was clear. That was job number one. Then job number two is actually having an honest conversation with myself around, is this the right place to do this? I fully appreciate that there are some companies if I had worked for and said, hey, I want to be a chief evangelist, would have been like, you're nuts. Here's the door. Like, go build that somewhere else. And so sometimes I think we may have the right idea. Um, we might have our own way of creating a destiny or creating a new role or whatever the, the path is that we're trying to proceed or proceed with but we're doing it in the wrong place. And it can be really, really difficult. We as humans are always wired to like love same and fear change. And, and I, I've grappled with that a lot in my career. But I think when you work for an organization that is open-minded and is willing to try new things, our confidence level to ask for the things that we want raises, right? Even if it's an organization, if it's a manager, if it's a boss, whatever the case may be. And so there are plenty of instances where I've talked to sellers who've just said, like, I feel like I'm at a dead end and I can't get anywhere with my organization. I'm not advocating everybody pick up their stuff and quit, but sometimes I think you could be the right person in the wrong place. And that's just an honest conversation we have to have with ourselves. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, it's good stuff. Well, well, I want to ask you, uh, and I'm going to take a, a, a detour a little bit here because you threw out the word passion. And so, uh, community, if you're ready for the next section here, I want you to type in the word hashtag passion because I want to dig on that one a little bit here. And it's funny because I'm, I'm actually reading, uh, listening. My, my community knows that I'm, I don't read really well, so I, I do audible. Um, but I'm, I'm re-listening to roller coaster. Um, um, shoot, success roller coaster. I think it is. I, I'll, I'll get it in a second. But okay. um, but it's by Darren. Hardy. Okay, the Entrepreneur Roller Coaster by Darren Hardy. Great, 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 great book. Uh, the first book I read by Darren Hardy was The Compound Effect. Great book. And this one's really, really good. And and again, I want your take on passion too. But he was saying that you know sometimes because I think there's a misnomer about the passion thing that you people have to find it in their job per se, but but he said, and I, I can't do it justice, and I should have been taking notes, and I wasn't. I'm going to go back and I'll, maybe I'll, 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 I'll write it all out. But he gave like five ways in which you can have passion, and one of them could be in your job itself. But one of them is passion in who? Who you're working with or who you're doing what you're doing for. Like maybe it's passion for your family. So that's why you're, 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 that's where you find passion in what you're doing because it's helping support your family. Um, so I'm curious – for you, because you mentioned passion, so it's like light bulb went off. For me. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to hear Jen speak about passion and what passion really means to you. If you could. Oh, man, what a great question. And and I want to acknowledge when I watched the video that you aired before we started talking, like one of the reasons I was excited to come on is because of the way that you speak about your passions. Like it is very, very evident to me. And it's always been important to me to have a job where people feel that. Like that is probably the highest compliment I can get from a customer or prospect is just like, wow, I can tell how much you love what you do. Um, I think for me, where I thought about finding my passion, I have definitely encountered times in my life where I was looking, to your point, far too much to the company or the job that I worked for to drive that passion. And appointment because just like we to create an organization or a job to do it. So I think there's absolutely a fine line. I love the way you spoke about that. But I think for me, if I'm going to spend eight hours giving my all to anything Monday through fi Friday in a week, it has to be something where people can feel my passion for, for doing it. Like with the sales, I'll give you a perfect example. Like I was doing account management for a while and I loved account management for like seven years I did it. And then I got to the point where I was just like, I'm looking at my calendar and I was like, that's an account management. That's an account management meeting. Oh, here's a new logo meeting or a cross sell meeting. And there was a spark. There was, a, it was like as simple as that. It was just looking at my calendar and realizing where my spark came from. 
And the last thing I want to do as it relates to my job is spend time with a customer who's choosing to spend time with me and not spend time on a million other things they could be doing and not bring that kind of passion. And so as it relates to this evangelist job, what really sparked it in me was I looked at a sales cycle and I said, where am I most excited about right now? Is it the end, the middle or the front? And what I realized was my passion was actually in the front. It was trying to help an executive think differently about what their sales team could do in order to win more business. Like the wins are still great. You get a commission check and I, I'll be the first to say like, I love those, but it didn't bring me as much passion. So sometimes I think it's really as simple as sitting down, auditing your day as it relates to your job and saying like, what are the things that get me excited versus where do I dread? And then also making sure to your point that we're balancing that. Like I picked up skiing during COVID because I was so insanely bored and just wanted a new challenge. And I'm not a great skier, but I love the act of learning, right? And learning is a big, a, a big passion of mine. So just finding different ways to balance your passion at work with, with your passion outside of it. Love that. And let me, let me jump in here real quick, Steve, because yeah. I did a BizDev Live episode yesterday and uh, Victor Nadaj and I were talking a lot about, it's a challenging thing to sort of separate out a pleasant work environment from joy from doing your work, right? You know, you can mm. be in a job doing something where you're selling it and it may not be something that you truly believe in, but the people around you are awesome. I dropped some quotes uh, into the, to the, to the chat here on LinkedIn and uh, YouTube around like, you know, the people around you, when you have good people around, you want to hold on to that. And so if you're happy, I mean, don't mess with a good thing, I guess. Right. But also, and right. If you want to drive that, that personal fulfillment in you're looking for those things that with or without the people around you that you'd be excited around, you know, and, and Corey Mitchell got in here with the spark and wanted to shout out our audience, Yolanda uh, Chen with, with, with always a, a great community member chiming in here with the passion. Uh, we've had Amanda, uh, from Rhode Island, I believe, checking in. Uh, so very excited for everybody that's checking in in the chat. If you're watching and you haven't gotten in the chat, please do. And please connect with each other. That's great stuff. That's amazing. Yeah. And thank you, Cameron. So that, that that's great perspective. And, and you know, it, it's funny. I, I think, you know, just to touch a little bit further on passion, and that is, you know, we, again, you know, we, there's so many things that, you know, we're, we hear the, the voices and I talked earlier about how our, we have this battlefield. And I think there's a lot of voices that say, you know, if you find, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And I, you know, I want to, I, I, you know, I, I, I probably said this before on broadcast, but okay. You tell me when you have a job that you love, tell me you would do it for free for <laughs> years. If that's true, then yeah, you love it. Right. But I doubt it, right? I think they're confusing, you know, enjoying something from being passionate about something. And because you're going to have some passions and you're going to have times where you're going to dread, like you said, you know, kind of, you know, that phone call or like I, I remember when I had my advertising company, I wasn't loving having to, you know, when I had to lay off somebody or let let them go and collecting money, you know, money from my my clients and, you know, grinding it out for, for new business, right? That back in the day, I was... I was the shy introverted guy and here I am on the phone smiling and dialing, trying to get business. It's, it was not, but I, but I did enjoy mm -hmm. the experience of having my own advertising company in my early twenties. That was wild. That was crazy. But did I love everything? Was I passionate about everything? No. Right. So, but overall, if you know what your mission is, what you know, what your cause is, you know, for me, I've got a life mission that has helped me tremendously. And again, I, I share it a little bit, obviously uh, on the show, which is to be the light uplift and inspire and, and really be a, be a beacon of hope for people. And for those who don't know, I'm, I keep my mom in prayer. She's been in, uh, in a facility for health challenges, and uh, you know, hopefully she'll she'll get well. And because she's always been very great supporter of our show, she's always on. And if you're wondering where, where's Diane Spiro, but her her maiden her actual maiden name, so part of my lineage is Light. So it was Diane Light growing up. Wow. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, funny enough. As we were, um, you know, I remember my mom back in the day when there was such a thing called an answering machine. I don't even know if anyone, half the people. I had an me. answering machine. Did yeah. you? All right. <laughs> but on her answering machine, her message would say, wishing you peace and light for the day. And 
Um, and so, yeah, so I guess it was destined to be the light, I guess, somehow, some way. But you were, you absolutely yeah. look, look at that. Ooh, the ultimate sales machine. Thank you, Cameron. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to, to bring this in the conversation. Of course, I hit the buttons too soon, but the idea of, you know, I've been listening to this book on the morning exercise. You want to get positive in your life. I was, I was putting tips out on Instagram and TikTok this morning. The idea that, you know, you get a little exercise, a little bit of uh, nature in your life and you, you talk about the things that you're you're thankful for. Uh, it can put you in that that positive mindset to sort of seek your destiny. But the idea of uh, there's a lot of ways to go about sales. And Steve was talking about the idea of, you know, there's there's aspects, especially in entrepreneurship, because at one point or another, you have to do these income producing activities, right? These IPAs, right? And so in sales, you know, it can be very challenging if you don't love asking people for money, you don't like the receivables piece. And I, I love uh, this book because it talks so much about the different ways that you approach sales. And so, you know, by providing market information and the reasons behind and the motivations, we we're talking about the passion, right? And so you can leverage your passions to form these conversations in a way that it's less about asking somebody for money and more about really talking about what you're passionate about. And then the sales pieces, I mean, especially in this day and age, and hopefully I'll get some nods from Steve and, and Jen here in terms of, you know, the link to buy, here's the, you know, the invoice, put a deposit down, that's it, right? That's yeah. the rest of the conversation. The sale is really the actual money transaction uh, piece of it. It's, it's so hard, I think, for so many people because they put that up First, they say, here's my link. Let me tell you why you should click it. And really the way it should be is this is, why. this is, this is, you know, who I am. This is why I'm passionate about, oh, you want to buy, here's the link. It's easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. classic start with why from Simon Sinek, right? You yeah, start with yeah. the why, not with the, with the what or the how, right? It's, it's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's one thing that's been really fascinating to me is you look at um, teachers, right? A teacher in my mind is one of the most admirable careers because they can take an unruly classroom and help people learn often when they don't want to learn complex concepts, right? So I look at a teacher and then I look at a salesperson and I think about, man, for those teachers that are exiting education, I'm sure many of them look at sales and say, oh, like it's it's skeevy and it's, I wouldn't want to do it. I had those same impressions of sales because my impression of sales growing up was just like the person with the watch, you know, the watches yeah. in their trench coat and how many yeah. do you want? And so I get excited by the idea of like when you're really focused on, to your point, like your passion and your why. And it's like, hey, I want to help people. I want to help people learn things that are going to benefit them in their lives there's a place for that in sales, right? And so I always get really excited when I see on LinkedIn that someone made the shift from education to, to selling because granted, it, like it's an observation, but I think a lot of them are actually tremendously successful because it's the same skill set, just different application. Absolutely. And you know, honestly, we're always selling, right? Yeah. You know, if, you're, if you're married, you know, you sold, right? If you're, <laughs> you know, got, any job you got, you sold, right? I mean, you had yeah. to, you know, and, and sales, is, it can be looked at as ugly, but if you're doing it the right way, which is really finding a need and hopefully figuring out a way to help fill that need, that's not pushy. I mean, that's what a teacher does. The need is somebody needs information and the teacher provides that information, right? It's just, it's the yeah. same. So good stuff. I, th by the way, I, I know we're throwing books around. I'll throw out another book, which you, you might've read, Jen. We may have spoken about this, but it's the Challenger Sale. Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great book. Um, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, but good stuff. But um, anyway, um, good stuff. So so I want to ask one last question as we close up and we're going to start to wrap up with you can maybe end it with how they could reach you best. But, sure. you know, and, and so if you're ready, uh, community, let's let's type in case as in uppercase, but just case C-A-S-E. And, uh, and we're going to ask this question, last question for Jen, and that is. How can you build a business case for a job inside of your company that doesn't already exist? And we'd like to hear your perspective. And you kind of touched on it a little bit, but maybe sort of much more tactical, tangible ways for our community if they are looking to do something like that. 
Absolutely. So first and foremost, I do not have all the answers here. This is a experience of one, um, but I will be very specific about what worked and yay, Challenger. So for me, um, and everybody is different here, and I want to be very cautious not to signal, hey, go do a job you don't have to prove that you can do it. But I do believe there is value in proof of concept. And so when I was talking about my job last year, I still had a full-time seller job. But because the thing I wanted to do was in line with my passion, I actually didn't mind putting the extra work in towards it because it was something that fulfilled me. It was something I you know, obviously enjoyed doing. And so when I went to make the case, it was actually far more about what I did before I built the business case that allowed that case to resonate. So I was able to say, look, in the last six months, right, it hasn't been a formalized job. I've tested this concept. And here are three opportunities that originated in, you know, my LinkedIn DMs. And here's how much in contract value those opportunities netted out. Now, this is just me doing this as a side project. If I was able to allocate time towards this full time, here's how I would see my activities, my time spend changing. And here's the overall impact I could perceive on the business relative to other investments we might make. So I want to call that out in particular. Um, this is something I've learned almost through selling is oftentimes you can have a great idea, but it's in competition with 10 other priorities, right? So they could have said, sure, Jen, you do this evangelist thing, or they could have said, no, we're going to dump X amount of dollars into marketing because we think it's going to have the same impact. So part of it was really going in and defining what are all the ways that I can assemble value for the organization, not value for Jen, but value for the organization around things I knew my CEO cared a lot about. So for us, it was market awareness for our company. It was um, removing some of the negative like misconceptions about Challenger as a sales model, which is really hard to do when you're reading like a Challenger branded marketing brochure. Um, and the third thing was actually ensuring that we inside Challenger were really living and breathing the methodology in our own sales interaction. So I took those three things and then I structured the role around it. So my best advice is start with the thing that the CEO cares most about, because those are the things that are going to catch their attention and won't feel like side projects that distract them. And then be very clear about not just what we will do. Like I stated in my job description, here is the, the set of activities that I will, will do and um, what those look like. But I also talked about what is, it, what is an alternative way of doing it and why this was more efficient. Right. So in the example of marketing, it was like, we want to create more awareness that Challenger Inc. exists. As an alternative to an evangelist, we could go spend X amount of dollars on paid search or paid ads or whatever the case may be. Um, but this is a, a much cheaper alternative to that. Right. And I think in many cases, cheaper alternatives, as long as they're effective, tend to resonate really well with leadership, especially in markets like these. So be very mindful of, of thinking about what are some of the alternatives and having a point of view on those alternatives that favors your case to be made. Um, so that was a big thing. And then, like I said, just being able to document and show impact prior to asking. Um, I've always approached my job like this. And again, I'm not saying it's for everybody, but I think it's benefited me very, very well because what's important to me is my own personal brand is someone looks at me as someone who's willing to put in work on the right things. And so I rarely ask people to take a leap of faith on me because I wouldn't want someone to do that to me. I, I, I'm much more comfortable saying, here's a small documented success. Now, what if we were able to multiply this by 10? Yeah. Um, so those are a few of the things that I used um, in my particular instance of, of, of crafting the role. Yeah, I, I know it's, a, it's an unusual concept uh, and, and probably the 20 something generation can't even relate, but there's something called go the, going the extra mile. It's actually from a book, a classic from I think the 30s called called Think and Grow Rich. And that's a big, it does a whole topic on that, a whole to, uh, chapter on that, which is something, do more and eventually on faith, yes. You know, no, not, okay, I'm not going to do it unless they pay me for it. No, that's that's just not a good way to go. Right. So for sure. 
So, Cameron, you came on here. Are we crushing it out, or, or you got yeah, something? We gotta go. There? We gotta do this. We gotta <laughs> people on their weights. We've given them some good stuff to chase their destiny down. We've got Jen Allen. We got the link in the comments so that they can connect with Jen. Make they sure to connect, connect with, Jen. with Jen. We got some action steps. So now it's all about going out and actually doing it, putting that action into place. If you watch this show, you know we're about the action. Uh, next week, episode seventy-three, Lisa. Gildenthal, course correcting, July 27th. So make sure that you She's are a bundle of energy. In. Jen, you're amazing. Lisa, she's she's like she's like on steroids. <laughs> or, you know, like something. I don't know, but she's she's like all energy. So it's great stuff. Awesome. But uh yeah, well, well, we appreciate Jen. You you've been Thanks. amazing on the show and you brought a lot of incredible value to our community and uh beacon of light yourself and uh just keep doing what you're doing and and, we, you know, I, I, as I said, our mission here is just to, to spread the good news, to be the light, you know, to inspire and uplift everybody. And, and that's what we're doing. So community, go out there, make sure you're connecting with each other. Get, you know, get in the comments and continue to if you are watching this on the replay, hashtag replay, please don't forget to support our sponsors. Uh, we've got uh, Les Wes Lamos of, of Sales Connector and also Jordan uh, Mendoza of Blaze Your Own Trail. Thank you, sir. Uh Great, great resources have been incredibly helpful for us, uh, whether you're in the sales world or not. It's, those are incredible resources. But we're going to cl close this like we always do. So as a community, we're going to shout out Crush It. We're going to count down one through five and then right out to Crush It. So five, five four, four, three, three two, two, one. one. Crush it. Crush it. <laughs> have an amazing week, everybody. Go out and have an amazing, amazing, productive week. We'll see you next Wednesday. Same bad time, same bad channel. Jen, thank you so much for being thank with you. us. And thank you to our audience who always comes through. Yolanda in the in the comments, crush it. Corey, thanks for checking in. Amanda and everybody else that's been watching along with us. The number's been ticking up. We appreciate you watching. Make sure you're connecting. Make sure you're getting into the comments. Make sure you're taking action. We appreciate you we will see you next week steve spiro you're a mentor you're a consultant you're a business owner but most importantly you're a host of your own show and you're also a master connector steve spiro is one of my idols and i love listening to everything that he does he's such a dynamic individual some of the topics i really enjoy speaking on is how to really connect you know, whether it be in person or through social media. I love to lead with my weaknesses. I lead with, you know, my vulnerabilities. It's fine because I'm okay with who I am. Number two is how to go from being inward focused, self-focused into others focused. Being willing to give and, and go out there and, and, and look to serve, that will attract the right things. Another one is on leveraging LinkedIn to really grow your business. You can reach a lot more people. You can broadcast a message to people that actually consented to want to know you. And then lastly, overcoming big obstacles. I love sharing. I was a shy jabroni kid, picked on, bullied, learning disabled, dyslexic, really in a dark place. I was really in a box in the shell and I've been able to break out of that box. And, and so I love being able to inspire people and really help them. So the Master Connector was born. The world is my networking event. Right? I meet people all the time. My goal is to meet three strangers every single day. Steve is open to meeting you. You should set up a face-to-face -face with Steve. One little conversation can really change your life.